Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. In this episode, we find out how dinosaurs made more dinosaurs. And Richard Herring has an appropriate yet intimate anatomy question. Hello and welcome to this episode of Terrible Lizards. Now, I have a warning. Well, this is the sort of episode, if we're watching a wildlife documentary, that you might want to like avoid if you're watching with your parents, because we're going to be talking about reproduction. That really embarrassing bit where you have to sort of start a conversation about something while the, you know, the lions in the Serengeti are doing their thing. That's this episode. And later on, we do have Richard Herring. Now, those of you who know Richard Herring will know that he uses euphemisms for certain biological words. And so if you know any, you know, people that you might be embarrassed listening to those words, I'm mean, not talking really bad ones, are we, Dave? No, no, there's nothing, there's nothing beyond pretty much PG. Yeah, but it's still, you know, I don't want I don't want somebody to just go, I cannot believe they said that word. Um, but it is Richard Herring. So we are we are talking about reproduction. If you do not want small people or old people or yourself knowing about this, then <laughs> it's it's quite we don't have to start with that. We could actually start with the result of reproduction, couldn't we? Because one of the things that I always want to know is how big dinosaur eggs were. Because you kind of assume a massive like you know diplodocus or something it's going to have like an egg the size of a beach ball yeah you would and yet they don't (sighs) they get big i mean Mm -hmm. way bigger than modern bird eggs and comparable and larger than things like elephant bird eggs and called ap ornis from madagascar you always see these giant eggs in museums and stuff the biggest dinosaur eggs that we have i think the quote i've seen is a volleyball size though i've never seen one that size i thought you were going to say i've never seen a volleyball and i'll be like no i've never i've never seen i've never seen they quite that big we do get some very long ones so there are some that are like 25 30 centimeters long but they're very kind of extended ovals rather than spheres is there a reason for that i mean the shape because the shape of eggs i find quite fascinating because they're structurally very strong in certain directions yeah most dinosaurs have either spherical a slightly squished sphere so almost like kind of satsuma shaped or yeah, this really long, you know, like giant paracetamol shape. <laughs> they don't have paracetamol in America, Dave. It's called something else over there, like a pill. Like pill, a yeah, cod pills, liver yeah. oil pill. <laughs> yeah, your, your standard kind of pill shape. Mm. And yeah, the, to a certain degree, these are about maintaining strength whilst increasing volume. But but that's kind of core to your question of were there, you know, absolutely giant beach ball plus size eggs? And the answer is no, because the dinosaur egg shells are fairly solid they're like bird eggs you know they're, they're, they actually be physically tough and hard and of course as you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger you've got more and more volume for your surface area and therefore you start having to make the eggshell thicker and thicker to hold that volume but of course th- th- these are eggs they have developing embryos inside them and you need tiny little pores in even that hard eggshell to breathe you need oxygen to get in and co2 to get out and if you make the eggshell really thick not enough oxygen and CO2 will diffuse. So you're going to get this trade-off where you get to the point where if you make the egg any bigger, the egg shell will have to be so thick that the embryo is not going to survive. So they they hit this limit, which is big, but yeah, you're right. When you start getting to animals that are five tons plus, you know, vastly bigger than any modern birds, you might expect the eggs to just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they don't. Um, they just lay more of them. Ah, a bit like fish. Yeah. So, you you know, there's this kind of fundamental trade-off in biology when you're having offspring of do you have a relatively few number of offspring and put loads of effort into looking after them, which is on average what mammals do. I mean, even things like rats and mice and possums, which might have 10 or 12 babies, that's not that many. And they're still born relatively large. And then mum is still uh, breastfeeding and giving them milk and so on and looking after them and so on and so forth. Or do you pump them out with a vast number and basically hope that some survive so yeah fish laying thousands tens of thousands even millions of eggs um and just you know (laughs) throwing them to the four winds and and hoping and it means that the bigger dinosaurs at least are kind of trapped where even if they'd inverted commas want to do a heavy investment strategy they simply can't because you just can't lay eggs that size which means that the larger dinosaurs are going to inevitably end up having loads and loads and loads of babies not all reptiles though um have hard cased eggs lots of them have soft like 
snakes don't they have and crocodiles don't they have soft eggs yeah so there's varying degrees of shell thickness in various different groups and indeed not all reptiles lay eggs a whole bunch of different lizards and a whole bunch of different snake groups have all independently evolved live birth and indeed a whole bunch of fossil reptiles did this too particularly the marine reptiles but dinosaurs seem to have been locked into hard eggshells in the same way that modern birds are there are no birds that don't lay eggs both dinosaurs and birds seem to have this thicker stronger eggshell but then have never evolved live bearing that we know of Uh, i mean there's always the possibility that we'll find a dinosaur with embryonic dinosaurs inside it but so far nothing and we have a lot of dinosaurs So if that was out there, I I suspect we might have found it by now. Okay. If we're going for the sort of lots of babies and eggs in one clutch, I mean, how big were the clutches? Well, so potentially huge, but it's it's really quite hard to say. As usual, the biology of animals is so varied that there are weird, quirky things that do weird, quirky things. And then that means there's always these possible exceptions that might screw up what you think would be a nice, simple bit of analysis. So we have loads and loads of fossil eggs. We have loads and loads of whole fossil nests um, where often we can attribute them directly to species. We talked about this with Tom Holland. Yeah, the oviraptor. Yeah, so Oviraptor and its relatives, things like Myosaurus, this hadrosaur from North America, and others, where we have either adults on nests or adults definitely in the area, and then juveniles or even embryos in eggs. So you can you absolutely know what species or near near as damn it what species you're dealing with. Um, the, so you'd think that like, well, you've got a nest of thirty eggs. Okay, they laid about 30 eggs and you, maybe you want to measure the volume of those eggs and compare them to the size of the adult and get an idea for what they're doing. That sounds fine and dandy until you realise that there are birds that do weird things. So ostriches, for example, females lay their eggs in multiple different nests. Females will wander around and find males build the nests and then females go and find them. And then if a female really likes a male, she'll lay a few eggs in his nest and then she'll go on and do that to another male. <laughs> so you could find an equivalent of a nest of ostrich eggs and find like 40 eggs in there and go, wow, ostriches lay lots of eggs. No, anything from five to a dozen different females all laid in that nest. That's not the output of a single animal. Yeah. And there are other birds that do similar stuff like this. That's amazing. No man, I think, would ever be very happy if that was a human situation. Just going, I really like you. I'll have a baby with you and leave it with you and then walk off and find another man have babies with him that's amazing just leave it with <laughs> that's great yeah, it, it's not it would be normal for a female ostrich to basically spread her eggs around like wow. that so but it means yeah if you look at just that nest and measure those eggs it would actually give you a very poor indication of the reproductive output of that species and okay things like this are relatively rare but of course we don't necessarily understand what the ecological and behavioral drivers are that have led ostriches and the other birds that do this to do this therefore we can't necessarily determine what may or may not have been going on you know with various other dinosaurs it's really hard to say so truodontids so that this is a group of very birdy dinosaurs these are extremely close to the origin of birds some analyses suggest that truodontids basically are the nearest thing to birds which are still dinosaurs so very much like a little velociraptor um there's some truodontid nests with loads and loads of eggs in them and yeah some animals have enormous reproductive outputs but I look at that and go, either truodontids lay an unbelievable amount of eggs or there is something weird going on here because, to my mind at least, or to my eye at least, that's an awful lot of pretty big eggs for a not particularly big animal. But again, again there's weird things like kiwis. Kiwis oh, lay yeah. the largest egg. If you look at an x-ray of a kiwi, it's basically an egg. <laughs> With a pair of feet and a beak. It's quite horrifying. I'm so glad I'm not a Kiwi. Um, and so they're obviously going down that route of maximum investment in single baby. Mm. But on average, dinosaurs are laying quite a few eggs. As I say, because apart, unless you're a relatively small one, you simply cannot go for the strategy of really big, very few eggs. So if you've got lots of, you know, reproductive energy, you'd be a fool not to put it into more eggs and have a better 
better chance of your gene surviving through the next generation. What is quite nice, though, is that they had nests. So they were sort of looking after... I mean, did they all have nests? So there evidence of just you find a random egg somewhere. Every so often you will find a random egg. But of course, it's a question of, you know, quite how did it get there? You know, eggs do roll away. Storms come in and wash nests away. And, and But as far as we can tell, most of them were making nests. And these were pretty simple. You know, you're talking about a scrape dug in the ground or a little kind of mound with a hollow in the middle. Um, there's not, for most... There's there's not much evidence that they're doing anything more complicated than that. Some at least appear to have gone down the kind of crocodile route, so that, or indeed some birds do this, and they're using piles of vegetation which keep things moist, and then the rotting vegetation will generate a bit of heat, keep things going. At least some, Oviraptor being one, the dinosaur is absolutely sitting on the nest, and then presumably covering their eggs with their feathers and themselves to keep them warm. Um, but some are doing really weird things. Um, there's this lovely group of sauropods called the titanosaurs because they're really big, big so <laughs> titan lizards but all sauropods are big <laughs> Uh, true um but yeah and the titanosaurs are mostly hanging around in uh south america and then some in africa madagascar and india and i think it's india where we've got this and there's a couple of places which are fields of eggs apparently there are places you can go where you're just walking across dinosaur eggs and eggshells like the easiest easter egg hunt ever yeah in in every direction that's all there is and this stuff is extremely volcanic uh it's it's all volcanic ash and, and volcanic sediments and the interpretation is they're actually using the geothermal energy to incubate the eggs and again there are there are animals that do this there are birds today which have learned or evolved to have basically exploited this why sit on a nest for weeks and months um you know incubating your eggs and you can't eat and you can't drink and if a predator finds you you're doomed and you're fairly exposed or you know or at least you have to fly off and sacrifice your eggs if you can just dig a hole lay the eggs and bury them and they're now completely invisible and they're incubated perfectly because the earth's generating heat for you just do that and it looks like at least the titanosaurs in india were doing exactly this because there are fields of eggs so they wouldn't have been scattered on the surface well possibly um a lot of sauropods actually have these weird giant thumb claws uh we didn't talk about this for diplodocus but there's another one they, they often have reduced claws and finger bones um but still have big claws on their thumbs okay can i just stop you and just say this is amazing because that means sauropods could like stuff on facebook because they could just, they could be like terrible lizards Facebook yes. page. They could thumbs <laughs> They've up already it. got a stumpy little thumbs up. Perfect. But yeah, one of the interpretations is that that's probably very useful for digging. And one of the things they might have been digging up is nests. Um, so that's a possibility, okay. except in titanosaurs, they mostly got rid of their fingers. Oh. Uh, not just, not just like the tips of the, the toes and the claws. They literally got rid of their fingers. They're effectively walking on their knuckles at the base of their hands. Uh, and their fingers vanished. So most of them were probably not great diggers i've noticed this about lots of pictures of sauropods that artists have drawn of them is they are more on their toes than you know they're not flat-footed as it were i know that elephants technically are walking on their toes but there's no there's no heel to ground as it were yeah so the, the hand is often this horseshoe shaped ring of fingers that are fairly bound together um and yeah they're, they're just walking on pretty much the tips of their toes for some reason the titanosaurs have just kind of worn them down almost yeah. Uh, to the point that they're, they're they're walking on on the tips of their knuckles. Um, so Titanosaur, okay, maybe they could dig with their feet because they think they've still got claws on the on the feet. But the other possibility is if this is just an ash field, there's probably nothing living there. So if they all go there and all lay their eggs, maybe they're just exposed on the surface. Because sure, there'll be some predatory birds and there'll be some predatory theropods and indeed mammals and stuff will probably go off and scarf a few eggs. But if this area is basically a desert, there's probably not a lot of stuff there so actually even going to the effort of burying them you know if 10,000 animals let's just say pluck a number but it's quite possible 10,000 females all go out and all lay 100 eggs what? there's literally millions out there in which case they're not all going to get eaten so why go to the trouble of digging big holes just I leave suppose. them there it's a bit like those um, turtles which go up onto the beach and all lay their eggs on one particular night and they've got that location that's what they do yeah you're, you're you know this again this is very common with this you know numerous baby strategy is you're basically just trying to swamp the predators mm. um you know if everyone laid their 
eggs in different places at different times, then all the predators wandering around would just keep finding babies and snap them up. But if they all come through in a massive rush, you know, basically, you know, it's like a buffet. There's only so much you can eat. <laughs> and, it, you know, and if the, if the smorgasbord is almost infinite, you're scarfed down a lot. But on average, low, you know, huge numbers will, will escape and, and, and be left unmolested. One thing that really confuses me, though, about this image that I have in my head of this, you know, this sort of desert volcanic ash fields that's nice and warm is that you've got, you know, other females stomping through it. How are you going to protect the eggs from not being stomped on? Again, probably not bothering oh, and just no. hoping it doesn't go too wrong. Well, again, you, you you know, but your turtles example, you mm. see that, you know, a turtle that's relatively late up into the beach. Now they do, do at least dig a hole. But yeah, they'll quite often excavate the nest of the person who was there a couple of hours ago and end up flinging some of the eggs down the beach. Um, but again, you know, if you're living, you know, if, if you're mature as a female sauropod and you've got 10, 15 years of egg laying maybe you lay twice a year and you're sticking out 100 150 eggs at a time actually it's not the end of the world if you lose a couple of nests because everyone tramples on them now baby dinosaurs because they're going to be cute obviously do we have many examples of baby dinosaurs and how can you tell it's a baby dinosaur and not a mature adult dinosaur so yes, we do, but we don't have many. So there were even a couple of papers back in the 70s suggesting that dinosaurs had some really weird form of reproduction where their juveniles were very, very rare. Um, and I wrote, and other people have done stuff on this, of course, but I, I wrote a, a fairly big paper challenging this idea and pointing out that the reason they're rare is they're probably being eaten. Mm. Um, so th- there are a number of biases against things like eggs and in particular baby dinosaurs getting into the fossil record and then us finding them. First of all, they're, if they're small, they're harder to find. When you're out wandering around looking for fossils, oddly enough, it's easier to spot an adult Diplodocus fossil <laughs> than it is a baby. Uh, right, it, and that sounds ridiculously obvious, but it is still true. You know, we only have so much energy to expend. Spotting big things is a lot easier than spotting small things. The second thing is by being small, um, and in particular because their bones are often quite soft, same as we might, you know, they're obviously relatively solid, but they're not that strong um, compared to adult. They're far more likely to decay. Um, you know, just being in water, they'll start dissolving or they'll fall apart much more easily and things like this. Um, the other one is, yeah, they, they'll just be eaten. Um, juveniles of everything get eaten at a rate vastly faster than adults. Um, and so they're going to be very vulnerable to that. And indeed, like basically pretty much all the evidence we have of or theropods hunting and well, or theropods just eating things. They ate juveniles. We, you know, we we talked about some of this with the bite mark stuff. And yeah, you with with T Rex and you those animals that we find with teeth wedged in them, they're juveniles, not adults. We have dinosaurs with stomach contents where they've consumed another dinosaur, cool. and it's almost inevitably a baby dinosaur or at least a young one. So one of the reasons we don't find many baby dinosaurs is they tended to get kind of destroyed by being eaten. And then the last bit, like, how do we know? Well, there's a bunch of different things. You know, humans and dinosaurs are very, very different. But some of the things that we recognize as being normal for our growth are basically pretty normal for vertebrates. So our bones get stronger and thicker and basically more, the the correct term is ossify. They increase their ossification. Basically, they have more of the crystalline bony stuff that makes them hard Um, and bits fuse together. You know, babies famously have more bones in their skulls than adults do for humans. Now, in reptiles, that doesn't really happen. There's a few rare cases where they do weird things. But those gaps do close up. And there are things like the vertebrae start in two pieces and then fuse into one piece. So you can look at even bits of a skeleton and see that the bone isn't very... uh, If you cut into it and look at a section, you can see that it's not particularly strengthened bone. You can look at the degree of fusion in various bones. Um, We can count growth rings. Growth rings? Yes. So just, just like trees... And again, this this is the problem with humans being humans is that so many frames of reference for biology, obviously, is ourselves and humans and indeed mammals are so weird in lots of ways compared to everything else. We're not weird. So we don't really have this, but reptiles and lots of other things, um, including amphibians and at least some fish, have growth rings. Every year they grow a greater layer on the outside. And therefore, if you cut through.
through their bones, you can count the rings, and one ring is one year. Isn't there something to do with a, a cod's ear or something like that? They age cod with it. Otoliths, yeah. They <laughs> they la- they have layers of bone put down in their ear elements, and yeah, it's a really good way of doing it because they don't degrade. Mm-hmm. So the the problem doing with this with reptiles, indeed most things, is they don't have marrow in quite the way that we do. But even the ones that are not pneumatic, because remember we talked about pneumatic animals. Um, do still have a hollow core in the middle of their bone, and that will increase. So they're adding rings to the outside, but those are also being eroded on the inside. So what you actually have to do really is find some small ones and some medium-sized ones and some big ones and cut into all three of them and count the growth rings and kind of get an estimate of quite what's happening so that you can estimate the amount that are missing from the middle as the middle has eroded out. What about incubation, though? Because like if... There's no way you could possibly know how long a dinosaur egg takes from laying till hatching. You'd think that until a paper came out ooh, about nine months ago now, which had the first really good data on this. Um, and what it, oh, I can't remember the exact terminology, um, but basically teeth as they grow, incredibly, we've literally just talked about growth rings in, in bones that are put down on an annular level. Teeth embryologically grow at a daily level and you will get literally like a ring that is laid down every single day during early development. So if you find an embryo that's got teeth and you can get into them with a sufficiently powerful scanner, you can count the rings and count the number of days. So it's a, the fossil is so good that you can actually count the rings on the, in the teeth. And how am I, Yeah. That's impossible. That's just magic. <laughs> this is at least in part because enamel on teeth is so unbelievably tough, mm. far tougher even than bone normally, and therefore it, it preserves really, really well. But the numbers for these were st- Staggering, way higher than anyone had ever predicted, um, which opens up a huge can of worms about what they're doing with their reproductive biology. So protoceratops, which is this early, well, in terms of time, quite derived, but in terms of appearance, quite early looking ceratopsian, hence its name. So close relative of triceratops and all the others, no real horns, just a frill that's Aww. living in the late Cretaceous. Big, pro- big protoceratops is maybe two meters long. So these are pretty diddy, you know, mm. Given given that it's on all fours and with a long tail, you know, this is kind of waist height to a it's human. Sort of like an Alsatian. Uh, yeah, pretty much, though, with very different proportions. <laughs> That's not a particularly big dinosaur. And the estimate for their um, uh, incubation time was three months um, now that's with a bit of fudging because of course they're not growing their teeth they're growing their teeth every day but the teeth don't develop super early embryologically and you don't know quite how close they are to hatching but that was the estimate alligators you know big ass reptiles that get to five meters plus and you know half a ton plus in weight two months okay. so this is a much longer incubation time on a much smaller animal so this is really early methodology they only published on two or three species so there's a huge amount of very Variation like to be out there. The other big one they had was one of the hadrosaurs. Six months was their estimate. Wow, so it's half like a, a year. Gestation. You know, that's yeah. Well, right, and and so the questions immediately become: if mum and dad, or mum or dad, are looking after the eggs, half a year just before they even hatch is a huge amount of time to be sitting around in one place. I mean, where'd you get the food from? You yeah. know, even, you know, that, that emperor penguin thing of where, you know, dad sits on the egg and mum goes and eats and comes back. And, you know, they're they just stop. there for months at a, months at a time. Right. Um, or are they abandoning their eggs, wandering off for six months, eating, doing all kinds of other things, coming back and locating their nest and then looking after their babies? <laughs> Who knows? Um, because we've known about this for under a year and we need time to have a real think about like, this a normal like a, a blackbird in the garden or a blue tit or something they it's a few weeks isn't a couple it? of weeks yeah yeah, yeah. So, i mean ge- generally you know incubation time increases with the size of the animal and the size of the egg okay but i th- i think people were thinking that the really big eggs like the biggest eggs might be three or four months and the hadrosaurs that they looked at are far from the biggest ornithischians going and they're six months wow. which means that yeah yeah, you're potentially looking at even longer times. 
but again, you know, there's so much uncertainty. Who knows? Maybe they were by complete chance. The researchers happened to have picked a couple of species with anomalously long gestation periods, and actually, or they're growing their teeth funnily. You know, maybe they're growing their teeth at double the rate for some random reason. In which case, suddenly you halve the number. Uh, you know, we're going to want to test quite a few more species. You know, there's no theropods in this. There's no sauropods in this. Who knows what else they might be doing? But as a first approximation, if this is true for dinosaur reproduction, yeah, their incubation period periods are enormous and that can't not have a massive effect on their reproductive biology and therefore all kinds of issues like do they pair up yeah Um, because yeah if you need to look after that nest for months and months and months that immediately is probably going to be the kind of situation where mum and dad are working together it's making me think the ostriches have got it right and the female ostrich could let dad get on with it i mean geez Right, and then that would trigger courtship rituals and pair bonding rituals and signalling and advertising and... You know, it, <laughs> right, but it has so many implications for their kind of fundamental behaviour and ecology. Yeah. And so now, yeah, a lot of people, well, me at least, because this is something I'm really interested in, it actually fits into a lot of research that I've done, kind of champing at the bit to go, is this normal or is this anomalous? Because either way, it's really interesting. If you do have a long incubation period on you know particular eggs surely the, the ones with the longest incubation period are going to be the ones that you find because they're more likely to be the ones that are forgotten or abandoned potentially of course yeah and and the other reason that eggs are often probably going to be quite rare is you're not going to lay your eggs in places which are vulnerable particularly not if they're vulnerable for six months at a, at a time mm. you know yes yeah, some animals living on flood plains periodically there's going to be a massive flood out of season and they're they're going to get buried course but if you live on a big floodplain and every march the waters rise up and flood it you're gonna start your breeding season when that's over Mm. and therefore the chances of there being a nice big flood to bury all the eggs so that we can find them is going to be pretty low um you know you you will not automatically nest somewhere where they're very likely to get buried um so that yeah that that gives us all kinds of limitations on what's going on with these kinds of fossils so let's let's talk parental care now obviously Obviously, they are not mammals. Then we know that mammals are the ones who, you know, do the milk and that sort of thing and do the nurturing, a lot of nurturing out, you know, when they're very young. So, I mean, I'm, I'm literally, the only thing I've got to go on is birds. I know that crocodiles leave their um, offsprings pretty much to fend for them. Oh, no, they don't because they keep them in their mouths, don't they? They look after them in their mouths. I've seen Yeah, that. so yeah. crocs, and by crocs, I mean crocodilian, so yes. crocodiles, alligators, gharials, caimans and other stuff. Um, so they all guard nests and they all look after their babies after they've hatched, at least for a bit. Um, and most people think that that's relatively brief. You know, it's a couple of weeks, you know, a couple of months at, at most. Um, but the longest record is something like over a year oh. that a, a female crocodile has been recorded definitively looking after and defending baby crocodiles. And, you know, a year is a good long period of time. Studying wild crocodile reproductive behavior is really difficult because big crocodiles are damn dangerous animals at the best of times. And then they've got their babies hanging around, <laughs> uh, which is un- unlikely to make them you know um and, and it doesn't help that you look like a tasty meal as well That's... yeah it, it's unlikely <laughs> to make them more convenient for this kind of research but for example there's a there's a wonderful crocodile collection in in oxfordshire a place called crocodiles of the world that i've been a few times and i've talked to the guys there because i'm trying to look at some crocodile models for some dinosaur work and um, the last time i was up there they've got a massive pair of alligators if, if you live in europe i think these are the largest alligators in captivity in europe and they bred and they had little baby alligators swimming about and i said to them i'm surprised you've let dad stay because my understanding was that although mum would defend them males really don't care about babies and even if it's just accidental it's tasty yeah he might eat them but even if it's just accidental you know he's not necessarily looking out for them and they went no 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 um he helps <gasps> look after them when we throw food in dad will break bits off and swim over to the babies and give it Aww. to them and you're like, okay, I've read a chunk at least. I've, you know, I'm no expert on crocodile reproductive behavior, but I've read some of the literature. There is no record of males getting engaged in parental care, let alone 
feeding them. And okay, this is potentially a pretty artificial system. They're in captivity. Yeah. He's the only male. He must know at some level that he's the father and these are definitively his babies. But still, this is not something that crocodilians are supposed to be engaging in. I like the fact that crocodiles and, um, sorry, crocodilians, because these are alligators. Um, I love the fact they're not deadbeat dads. That's a really lovely, you know. No, they're um, not. But it, but it, at, at the bare minimum, it shows you that there is a capacity in these groups to engage in some relatively complex care behaviour. We absolutely know birds do that. We see it in crocodilians. Again, your extant phylogenetic bracket. Birds are doing it. Crocodiles are doing it. Dinosaurs are probably doing it. And yeah, we, we mentioned with Tom Holland the um, large babies in nests, which can only be there if someone's been feeding them, mm. which shows you that, you know, someone's looking after them. Yeah, or, or they're just returning to the nest because it's a place to hang, maybe? Or is that it, unlikely? It seems unlikely because they've got to go and... This is, this is So this is an animal called Myasaura and this is a, the place is literally called Egg Mountain because it's <laughs> nest after nest after nest after nest. All the nests conveniently are spaced about one adult Myasaura length apart, which suggests that they've, you know, just flamingos do something very similar, you know, this mass nesting colony and gulls and they're all sitting just out of pecking each other constantly range. Well, it's social distancing. It's, it's fair. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. But you can imagine if you're anywhere near the middle, which is actually usually the better place to be because of course you, the further in the further the less likely predators are to reach it if those babies are somehow got to return to that nest constantly mm. they've got to make their way all the way through the colony to start trying to find food and all the others will have got there first go even further find food and then come back again you know doing that repeatedly for days or weeks um, Myros- pretty unlikely and myrosaurs are those duck build ones with the big sweepy like the headdress almost the big flat swoopy bit am I thinking that so right so myosaura is one of so there's basic so the hadrosaurs the duck have yeah. two basic groups one group has the big weird crests on the head and the other group don't and myosaura is from the group that don't so in, in that in that regards they've got a relatively boring head <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. This thing. I, I pretend to like dinosaurs, and I get muddled. Uh, <laughs> there's too many. This, but no, there's many. You know, there's too few. We should find more. This is this is the thing. As I say, there's 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 almost certainly. Well, I mean, there are certainly more species coming. I mean, that's that's taken as red. There is a question of just how many more groups are there to find. Um, which I've I've got a new book coming out next year, and I I put a chapter on on the or well, not a whole chapter, but this is this is a real question of after a, you know 150 years of discovery, why what might we be missing? Um, you know, is there some extremely weird offshoot of their evolution which we haven't turned up yet. Of course, it's very hard to, to try and determine. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the Aztec feathered snake. That's what I want to see. A dinosaur has lost all its limbs, become a feathered snake, so the Aztecs were right. That's what I want. I wouldn't <laughs> hold your breath on oh! that one. Well, you know, lizards evolve, you know, you get slow worms. So, could, could. Yeah, there, there are, God, something like 20 different lineages of lizards that have lost their limbs at one time or other, including snakes. So snakes are lizards. Um, but yeah, so when, but just uh, just as I probably won't make it in the podcast, when did snakes evolve to be snakes? Then oh When's boy, the snake? um, there's I think there's this weird early Cretaceous thing from Brazil, which was argued to be the earliest known snake, though it's still got little limbs on it, mm. which now people think probably isn't a snake. Um, there are definitive snakes from the Cretaceous, including mm. a really nice big one found with a nest of titanosaur eggs, <gasps> which is quite neat. So that's argued as being a relatively early example of... Predation. Yeah, um, predation of eggs and embryos by, uh, and potentially juveniles. Well, the, the dinosaurs are foolish because they're making their eggs, like, swallowable for snakes if they're very long and thin. The, to be fair, this was a big snake. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean this is you know proper python size, you know, not some diddy little thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, it was it was a big snake. But where we, yeah, snake snake evolution. I don't know about the origin of snakes. Yeah, it almost certainly goes back into the Jurassic. Okay. Uh, and there's a big question of did they did they start off as burrowing or did they start off as swimming? Because lots of swimming things tend to lose their legs. So there's lots of legless amphibians which are swimmers, and there's lots of burrowing things like various lizards, um, and indeed. 
some amphibians which have lost their legs. And these are both obvious ways of having a very sinusoidal body motion through a material where having legs sticking out actually doesn't help you. Um, but that, that's a big question is, were, were snakes kind of burrowing first or swimming first? And we don't know. Is there anything that we know about their sort of like, you know, who got to mate? Is it a case of one man and loads of lady dinosaurs or what's what's happening here yeah so that this is this is what a huge amount of my research has has been on for the last few years so i can talk about this for about three episodes worth Excellent. if you're desperate um, <laughs> i mean the, the first the first thing to talk about really actually is can we tell males and females apart which is actually a, a fairly big issue in itself mm. uh, and the answer is not really oh. um so when when females again true of reptiles birds um and also dinosaurs uh, when reptiles are laying eggs they need a lot of calcium very quickly because you're laying a bunch of eggs they've all got calcium shells you need that um and for and the way females do this is they grow in the run-up to laying eggs they grow this special type of bone on big bones so things like your humerus and your femur so big but big long bones in the limbs they they grow this extra weird layer of bone called medullary bone and dinosaurs did that too so we can find skeletons we can cut a little chunk out of them we can grind it down look at it under a microscope look for the structure and if it's got the structure of medullary bone that is a female in the breeding season and that's just so that they have enough um calcium that they're storing it somewhere else so they can use it later to make an egg yeah it's so it has this really distinctive texture because it's super super porous because mm. it's super full of blood vessels so that it can all be broken down very quickly mm. and then ported across into the eggshell oh, see so. this is this is from a, from a girl's perspective this means that you know as well as like you know just before you lay an egg you're gonna have leg ache that's you're gonna have arm Wait, and I leg haven't ache. Considered my, my, i don't know if it i don't know if it hurts necessarily but yeah it's definitely some weird physiology as a female mammal you know if you're producing things which are there for babies which don't get used it certainly does hurt a little bit so True. you know this is <laughs> i'm imagining they'd, they'd have got leg ache if that's being broken down that would have hurt quite possibly um but anyway that that gives you definitive female dinosaurs mm. so we can do that but of course if you don't find medullary bone it could have been a male. It could have been a female out of breeding season. It could have been a female who was too young. Maybe she was just sick. If she's sick that year, she's probably not laying eggs. Not getting enough nutrition. Yeah. And presumably just before you die, a lot of dinosaurs would have died of starvation or other causes like that. And therefore, you're not going to get many yeah. with medullary bone. Right. So um, we do find dinosaurs with medullary bone. We can identify females, but it's not that anything that doesn't have that is a male, mm. um, which of course very uh, is very annoying uh the, for the record we've got a couple of uh it's the truodontids again where we've got a, a dinosaur on a nest of eggs not showing medullary bone Ooh. which suggests that it's a male and so you've got males brooding on the nest now it's possible of course that those are relatively old eggs and the female if she hasn't been laying eggs for a few weeks and then the medullary bone's gone but it's at least a possibility that that is a male brooding on a nest of eggs i mean you see it with hawks and things like that that they will help raise eggs which aren't their own if they're related to i know this because it was on spring watch uh where there was um a load of um oh what were they they were peregrine falcons and they were up in bath and then you had relatives of the um but the breeding pair would come in and help as well so it could be maybe something like that there's particularly a phenomenon called helper at the nest which is if you have for birds if they breed twice in a season mm. so th things like uh and no blue tits don't do this but obviously they might have a second and clutch of eggs mm. the juveniles from the first clutch will help feed the babies oh. because of course they're 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 100 true siblings and therefore mm. very closely related and you're not going to reproduce and who knows you may not survive till next year so it's probably a good idea to help out what but else are you going to do right but that's breeding? but that's where they're breeding twice in one season whereas if we've just said if they've got a six months gestation yeah. they're probably not going through cycles like that um so yeah t telling males and females apart not easy um and then the classic things that we'd expect like yeah um you know deer and some antelope uh, some antelope where males have some you know horns or some other big structure and females don't um doesn't really turn up in dinosaurs and of course there's loads and loads of dinosaurs known from just one or two specimens and it may not tell us very much but things like the ceratopsians we've now got 40 50 species represented by literally thousands of skeletons there's no such thing as a ceratopsian that doesn't have a frill and some horns and spikes on it 
you know, there, there is no species where there's obviously the one with no spikes or the one with no horns or the ones with no frill, or at least, you know, half of them, which is what you'd expect from a classic male-female split. I mean, could it be that they're so dimorphic that they've been categorised as a separate species? As different species. So that's been argued in the past for various ones. So our hadrosaurs, yet again, there were versions like that with either a crest and a crestless or two different types of crest on the head being inferred to be males and females a much better study that came i mean this was something in, this was bandied about in the 70s and 80s um some work that came through in the early 2000s went back and id'd the original locations of a lot of the specimens because a lot of this stuff was dug up in the early 1900s and all the males were from one geological layer and all the females were from another geological layer hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we hang out in different times and places i mean that's talk talk about hen and a stag do that's quite different yeah <laughs> right. So, A, obviously that kind of rained on that parade quite heavily, but B, actually, there is a real distinct point there. So, you know, most people are familiar with the, you know, giant wildebeest migration that you get because every Attenborough and equivalent documentary yeah. has to have a million wildebeest crossing the, the Serengeti. Film the crocodiles having their lunch. Have you said, yeah, quite. <laughs> that happens in the Serengeti Masai Mara. But if you go down, so this is Kenya, Tanzania, if you, on the equator, if you go down to South Africa, which has very different seasonality, actually what happens is the females all wander off with their babies to places where there's better food. And the males stay behind and mark out their little territories and wait for the females to come back. <laughs> I wondered what you were going to say there. I thought you were going to say, I was going to say, this, <laughs> these, these sound a lot like my stepfather. The females and the children go off and the men stay behind and suffer <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty much and sulk <laughs> they basically wait through the bad period and wait for the females to come back and then try and build up a little harem but the point being if you think about that from what might happen in terms of fossilization mm. it means that there's a big chunk of the year where the males and females are fundamentally living in different places doing different things and therefore one lot are going to be hanging around in one area where they might be fossilized and the other lot are hanging around in another area where they might not be fossilized and if you fast forward the clock and then come back as a paleontologist, you'd only ever find females. Yeah. Because the males lived somewhere else at the time that like floods were happening and burying animals. So there could be horribly misleading things in the fossil record where we look around and go, wow, every single one of this has a giant horn. Males and females must have had giant horns. It's like, no, we these are these are all male. But of course we wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Triceratops episode, where we have, oh, is this a mature Triceratops? But it's only found in areas that the other Triceratops aren't. And you're just like, oh my goodness, what if they're massive boys? No, no, yeah. Again, so this, this is this is the kind of thing which is probably going to be true of relatively small groups, mm. uh, as it's for relatively small numbers of fossils, or true where we've got a single mass mortality event. So, you, you know, you've killed a hundred in one go, but if they were all doing one thing at one time. But your average dinosaur with a good fossil Fossil record, something like T. Rex, for example. Okay, we got 25, 30 good skeletons and quite a few other bits and bobs with some decent skulls in places. They're scattered across a couple of million years and everywhere from Alberta down, as I said, towards New Mexico. The idea that we've only ever picked up males from that, or we've only picked up females, seems really pretty unlikely. You know, there, there are too many places, too much time, too many different environments that, that that's really not very likely at all. Um, and so, yeah, on average, it looks like the ones that don't have crests don't have crests, and the ones that do have crests do have crests. I'm sure there are exceptions, and we just haven't found them out yet yeah. or worked them out yet. And, and similarly, body size dimorphism. So just males being much bigger than females. And yet there, there's some things where females are bigger than males. Spiders. I don't think we talked about this for T-Rex. So there's this thing that female T-Rex were bigger than males. Because with predatory birds, with hawks, a lot of females are much bigger than males and owls. Peregrine falcons again. And pe peregrine yeah. falcons, owls, a whole bunch of others. Um, that's to do with certain kinds of specialised flight um, and is not true of <laughs> uh, Tyrannosaurus. So yeah, but we, you know, size dimorphism in dinosaurs um, is probably there, but again, we, we can't find it. So I and a colleague of mine, Jordan Malland in uh, Canada, have written between us several papers on this stuff and one together, couple together. Um, 
looking at growth. And part of the problem for this is that if you're a mammal or a bird, you basically grow very, very quickly. You become full size and then you basically stay at that size for the rest of your life. Whereas although dinosaurs grow pretty fast and faster than most reptiles, they grow for a very long period. Yeah, because crocodiles get massive, don't they? Some of them... Yeah. And do they ever stop? Uh, so no, crocodiles don't. They oh have goodness. what's called indeterminate yeah. growth. So as long as they're, and fish, as long as they're alive, they're growing. Wow. Now it really slows down and these hundred year old crocs are not much bigger than they were at say 50. It's not like they've doubled in that time, but they would still be growing. Um, but yeah, with the dinosaurs, they're growing over these very extended periods. And what that means is if you're just sampling across the population, males on average would be bigger than females. And if you're both say 20 years old, a male would be much bigger than a female but a 20 year old female is probably bigger than a 15 year old male and a 10 year old female is probably bigger than a seven year old male or at least about the same size so unless you know the sex and age of your individual specimens it's very hard to tell males from females apart even if the males are all bigger than the females because you can't pull them apart of this kind of shotgun on the on the graph of all these different little data points and there's no such thing in dinosaurs as like childbearing hips, are there? Because they're all. That's actually sort of been suggested. That sounds. Really? That, <laughs> I know. You're right. So I know you're making a joke, but no. So on the tail of reptiles, there are these little bones that hang down underneath the tail called chevrons. We talked about them with Diplodocus because Diplodocus double beam is double beam chevrons. Um, and the first two or three bones of the tail don't have chevrons. And there was an idea doing the rounds that uh, alligators, the females have one fewer chevrons than the male at the base of the tail to make a little more space for the eggs. Um, and people went, this is great. We can try and use this to diagnose male and females. Because again, normally, yeah, the egg is much smaller than the pelvic opening and therefore you wouldn't expect the pelvis to have altered in size. Um, it turns out, unfortunately, that's not really true. And that actually chevron number and exact position at the start just varies a bit. Um, and so it's probably not very indicative, unfortunately. And so of course, they, mu- so they might you- have had it slightly separated in a different place, but of course, you're looking at fossils so they're not in the place they would have been anyway yeah and you'd want again you'd you'd want a good data set and mm. yada 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 so pterosaurs again not to get off on pterosaurs too much honestly they're not dinosaurs but pterosaurs <laughs> having a very odd body proportion and a very tiny pelvis because of the way they're built in at least a couple of species it looks like females do have a bigger <gasps> pelvic opening than males and that's for egg laying and in, in one pterosaur we have a pterosaur with an egg, one egg inside the body and one egg just outside the body uh, and they have a bigger pelvic opening and the head of that female has no crest on it and the putative male has a crest and a smaller pelvis wow. so that is exactly what you'd predict from kind of classic sexual dimorphism of the female has no big signaling trait and a different reproductive system or cool. opening yeah which is really quite neat yeah. but we don't see that with dinosaurs so yeah as i say i'm, I'm sure there are loads of things out there and we either haven't found them yet or we just can't demonstrate it with the fossils and the methods that we're using but currently it is hard to say that there is a lot of dimorphism going on and that males are bigger than females or that males have particularly bigger or more elaborate or different head crests but again i think we talked about this with tom a little bit we don't know how much of that is soft tissue yeah we don't know if they're missing inflatable throat sacs or different color or making different sounds yeah like birds of paradise yeah, you know, that a male and female peacock, or peafowl to be proper, they, they don't look very different in terms of their skeleton because it's all the extra stuff which is what's making them really different. And, of course, that's not going to show up on the average bony fossil. You just mentioned, you know, about songs and things like that because it is in one of the Jurassic Park films. They get a, a velociraptor throat bone and somehow make a noise through it, which is ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's, supposed, um, it's supposed to be a... I think it's like a 3D print of the palette. Yeah. So the space kind of under and behind the sinuses. Yeah. Is there any way of knowing? Because we know that songbirds obviously sing for mates and have really intricate songs and that sort of thing. Do we know if dinosaurs, 
did anything like that at all? Well, it, it, it would be odd if they didn't. So many birds do that. Now, birds obviously in particular have often have really long and complex songs, and that's associated with a specialised modification of the, the trachea uh, called the syrinx. We wouldn't necessarily, ex- well, we really don't expect that in dinosaurs for various reasons, but cores at least are a big part of that. That's also true of lots of um, crocodilians. Um, so alligators and crocodiles do various roars and inf- they, they make a lot of infrasound. So Baby crocodiles, super, super when they're just hatched, sound exactly oh, yeah. like American cheerleaders. They come out of, they seriously, when they, they bump the into keeping. each other, when they go in, bump into each other, they go, oh, oh. Yeah. they sound outraged at each other. Oh. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> and they make this lovely little ow noise. Yeah, so they do ow, ow, ow. The crocodiles of the world. So I was up there years ago and it was, I can't remember what it was. I think it was the spectacled caiman had bred and they had all the babies in a big tank because um, they were rearing them. Uh, and me and my friend were just watching them and taking photos. And a couple of the babies start calling. Um, Ow. And yeah, yeah. And I went, <laughs> ooh, normally parents respond to that. I wonder if the female can still hear and would still respond. Mm. So I went round the corner to, this, this was like a mid-afternoon on a Thursday. He and I were like the only people there. So there's no one else around. So I went round the corner back to where the caiman was. And the female charged across the enclosure and hurled herself at the glass at my head height. <laughs> and it's like, I think she heard that. <laughs> so, but there, there's an example. You know, she, she hadn't seen those babies probably for weeks because they were isolated and being, and being reared uh, and being protected from any accidents with mum and dad. And yeah, that was her response when she heard Aww, one of them call. That's quite Which sad. is just to attack the first thing that she saw. In a way, yeah, but it's a real demonstration of, again, this idea that, oh, crocs basically just dump the babies in the water and that's the end of it mm. after they've hatched. No. Yeah. Um, you know, their, their engagement is, is far more serious. But yeah, loads of them, you know, again, we used to think of crocodiles as being quite quiet and then the odd movie, you get the alligators and do a big kind of roary hiss. Mm. But some of that stuff is actually, yeah, it's intimately involved in their courtship rituals. So there is no reason at all to think that dinosaurs, A, weren't calling and communicating in various different ways ways and be that that wasn't potentially an important part of um reproduction and so you could know you, courtship so could you make a 3d print of a, a of a dinosaur you know skull and get an idea of the noises they could generate no of course not oh, <laughs> well, with, with one exception mm. which is or at least a couple of exceptions and that is your lambiosaur uh, uh, well lambiosaur is another one but in particular a thing called parasaurolophus which is what i think you were thinking of when we we're talking about myosaur so the one with this giant elongate half a trombone yeah. out the back of its head because that is widely regarded as a sound producing structure it is directly con- connected to the nasal passage when they breathe in they breathe in through their nose and it goes all the way up that then all the way back down again and then down the throat and into the lungs and yeah we have modeled that as a resonating chamber and yeah it makes a tanking great noise a really big Ooh. deep boom and it is very reasonable to interpret that as some kind of sound producer and then you get again this this really complicated and interesting question of is that evolving because it makes a cool sound or is that evolving because it looks cool both bit of a chicken and egg did the sound come first or the visual come first or were they always been intimately linked as far as we we have very few parasaurolophus skulls at all but we've got a bunch of the other hadrosaurs that have similar convoluted passages as far as we can tell males and females both had this so are they communi- how are they communicating to each other? Is this pairing? Well, if they're anything like geese, they're going to be yeah. yelling constantly. I mean, this is the yeah. other thing is, 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 you know, dinosaur size, because I know like the la- one of the loudest birds that you get in your garden in the UK is a wren, which is the tiniest little ping pong thing. And it yells like it's so loud. It's yeah. as loud as a blackbird. Yeah, resonance and being, you know, if you're set up right, you can make a lot of noise with not very much. I mean, a uh, kakapo. So this is the owl parrot from New Zealand, this yes. giant flightless parrot, wonderfully weird bird. Now, males cheat a bit because they dig these bowl-shaped depressions, which they then sit in. But, you know, a big kakapo is still, um, I'm trying to think of something approximately. Yeah, it's about as chicken size. Yeah. It's yeah. a big, big chicken. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's not, you know, we're not, we're not talking Talking like rear cassowary, small ostrich no. kind of thing. You know, it's a good sized bird, and they're using this hollow to help act as a resonator. But they can be heard miles away. 
literally miles. So you can make a big sound from a relatively small animal. So yeah, a, a Parasaurolophus crest. Bittens as well in the UK. Bittens are... Bittens a, yeah, with a boo. Yeah, and bittens are not that big. No. Uh, and yeah, make a lot of noise. So yeah, a, a big Parasaurolophus crest is... I'm holding my arms in the air, 70, 80 centimetres long, and then it comes back again, and it's got yes. some convolutions in there, and it's going to be 15, 20 centimetres across, as in its internal diameter. Yeah, you, you're going to get some real volume out of that with a five, six ton animal, or four or five ton animal, maybe. So we we can be sure that the, the sound of those animals mating would have been quite. <laughs> I think I, I think come come mating season, you would have known about it. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about mating because uh, we have down the line now uh, one of my heroes of comedy who's obsessed with mating in every single respect, but usually the funniest sort. So, like I said at the beginning of the program, if you're not comfortable with euphemisms for certain body parts this is not the part of the show for you like i say it's pg but you know if you don't like uh if you'd rather uh, say phallus or penis you're going to be disappointed because here we have down the line the magnificent comedy hero richard herring is here to join us to ask the question that he's always wanted to know about terrible lizards well, yes, predictably, I guess. I mean, I've written a book called Talking Cock, and so, and I, <laughs> I didn't get into. I didn't. I did look at animal penises. I mean, not. I didn't. I didn't. I researched them. Of I at them. Um, but I never thought to. Uh, I mean, I've sort of made assumptions about dinosaurs that they're like birds, so cloacas, as I like to pronounce. I'm not sure that's the right pronunciation. But did dinosaurs have uh, penises or cocks, as I would call them? Yeah, so that, that that's a question that we we really don't know the answer to in some level, but the answer equally is probably right. So uh, yes, you cloaca cloaca. Uh, yes, is the single exit, which is actually what most animals have. So that's the genitourinary opening. In other words, they we and poo and have sex through that or lay eggs accordingly. All lizards and crocodiles and birds have that and therefore so did dinosaurs. But obviously the question is, how do you bring those two together for male and female for reproduction? And if you're a lizard or a crocodile, that's not necessarily too difficult. But if you look at you know, really big things like Brachiosaurus or armoured things like Ankylosaurs and Stegosaurs, it's really hard to work out how these two things could actually physically get together (laughs) and just push together cloacas. And the obvious solution to this is to have some form of penis. Now, a bunch of lizards and crocodiles and other things actually do this. Ducks famously have explosively inflating corkscrew penises, obviously. (laughs) So we're in this position where, from a dinosaur point of view, that's the kind of thing that would probably never fossilize. You know, it'd be purely soft tissue, no bone. It is very, very unlikely to ever preserve. And even if it did, we may not recognize what it was, because obviously everything else would then be preserved with guts and livers and kidneys and stuff. On the other hand, it is hard to imagine that some of these animals reproduced without one. And therefore, the answer is very probably, yes, a whole bunch of them did have a penis. Right. One each, though, hopefully. Uh, well, so so lizards have what's called a hemipenis, which is basically forked. Um, and so it starts off as a single one and then spreads into two ends. Whether or not that was the case in dinosaurs, we don't know. Again, things like ducks have extremely complicated penises and duck females have extremely complicated vaginas. So who knows what some dinosaur species may have done? Well, I want you to know. I don't want you to say you don't know. <laughs> That's, the best, <laughs> That's the best answer I can give you. Get the models of the dinosaurs and work out what, how they did it. You must well, be able to. Pe- people have physically done that. That, that yeah. it, it sounds like a joke, but like, how else are you going to do it? I mean, with the, with the modern you know computer graphics and stuff, people are starting to look at that in more detail. But functionally, people yeah. have got you know, some of the really high-end toys and physical models and built joints into the legs and things and tried to work out how can you actually physically get these animals together? Yeah. And as we found out, it is very, either you end up in not necessarily impossible, but odd positions. So for example, Stegosaurus, it's been suggested that the female lies down on her side and then the male kind of stands across her. Mm-hmm. But even then you're actually struggling to get the cloacas together 
Um, and yeah, things like the ankylosaurs, which are covered in armor, are not flexible animals and have enormously wide hips and stumpy little legs. You can't really conceive of how they'd physically mate without something like this. Yeah. Which dinosaur do you think, would, would you guess, had the biggest cock out of all the dinosaurs? And would it be bigger than the, the biggest whale cock in the world if, it, if they did? <laughs> uh, my, my, my guess is it's going to be either one of the really big sauropods. Yeah. Uh, so the big long neck, long tailed Diplodocus, Apatosaurus. They group. say long neck, big cock. That's what the dinosaurs used to say. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, big hands, big feet, big neck. Either one of them, or again, yeah, one of the big ankylosaurs. Uh, yeah, the, the sauropods, the problem is simply weight. I mean, you know, the biggest of them are 60, 70 tons. Wow. Could a female really support a male sitting on top of her? Um, maybe in water, but then water isn't always available, and some of these animals lived in deserts, so that probably wasn't an option. Um, and, yeah, so the solution would be that. Bigger than a whale? Quite possibly. I mean, yeah, blue whales and sperm whales have very large penises, but, again, uh, they're at least they can get face to face relatively easily a 60 ton 40 meter long dinosaur not so much very interesting so <laughs> i'm glad i'm glad when you, you study that. dinosaurs at university how long do you spend talking about them having sex and their penises and stuff and is it um, proportionate it, to other parts of their bodies it, it never came up in my in my studies unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those areas which hasn't been studied very much, not because paleontologists aren't interested in it, but because, as we say, there's so little data, there's very little you can actually say uh, beyond pretty much what we've just covered here. Um, so, yeah, we're a bit we're a bit stuck with probably for some of them. And here are some of those candidates based on the fact that they're really awkward body shapes or just massive animals. They might have had a kind of harpoon penis that they could shoot across from the distance. Well, animals do. Uh, yeah. So slugs and snails do that. And then the uh, argonaut, the um, paper nautilus, which is a kind of octopus, has the male has a detachable penis, which then yeah. swims off to find the female. That doesn't show up in invertebrates, though. So I, I, I doubt that's going on in the dinosaurs. Okay. What about what, what, what are the animals with the really large hips again, Dave? So the ankylosaurs. So ankylosaurs. Yeah. So, so ankylosaurus like and all turtles, of its relatives. Don't they? Um, they're very armoured, so huge bony plates over the entire body with a big row of spikes down the side and over the back. Some of them have this famous club tail at the end. Um, oh, yeah. But even the giant ones, I mean, Ankylosaurus and Edmontus, uh, Edmontonia are some of the biggest. They're about a metre and a half, two metres to the top of the hips. But those hips are also about two, two and a half metres wide. So they're extremely wide bodied. And then there's a row of spikes and plates on the outside. And actually their pelvis is covered in this solid sheet of bone. So again, like how two animals like that mate. Um, Does the yeah. uh, cloaca move down the body of some animals sometimes to accommodate that? So it's sort of not where you'd expect it to be. Is that right? Or am I no, right? not, not that I'm aware of. So um you, it, it pretty much has to be where it is because it goes because it, well, it goes through the through the pelvis. Um, yeah. So nipples famously move a lot in various mammals. Yeah. Um, so thing, things like um, manatees have them in their armpits, for example, but then kangaroos have them inside the pouch. So that's a pretty big difference across the body. But the yeah, the reproductive system basically doesn't move, and the exit basically doesn't move. I can't. I was trying to sort out for you, but I can't help you. <laughs> it's a nice try. Thank you. <laughs> You've either got to imagine that these creatures have a really long penis so that the man can stand next to the girl and do it, or maybe they lift their tails up and sort of yeah. curl over like scorpions back to back. Or the man does flip, they do a reverse cowgirl, because he's only got a short one, right? They do, And then, because he can't flip back, he's just left there to die. Yeah, the standing up again bit afterwards would seem to limit a bunch of them. You know, there, there are some animals that... that die after mating and only mate once but there's no reason to think the dinosaurs were one of them so i think oh. we can rule that one out there's no like just... big planes as really satisfied looking fossils <laughs> no they're, 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 sadly they're fairly expressionless on their face so it may be tough to find which ones looked happy so did we answer your question at all richard well <laughs> <laughs> not it's to the... my satisfaction I'm more what? interested in the detachable penis. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about a penis swimming off on its own. 
There are videos of this on YouTube if you want to look. I'm going to want to have a look at that. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting. It was, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't convinced there would be any penises involved, so I'm happy to find out that there probably were. Excellent. <laughs> the penises have been going that long, and cock jokes presumably go back to the dinosaur era. era. It would be it sad was, if they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and what was your book um, called again, Richard, for people My who book want was called to... Talking, Talking Cock, uh, so you can still get it on the Kindle, I think. It's uh, it was it's from two thousand and one, two thousand and two. So uh, you know it's not totally up to date. Uh, well, if, if, if cock, there's a second uh, edition, uh, you, you know what to include now. Yeah, absolutely. There'll be a whole chapter on dinosaurs and all excellent. Sorts. <laughs> Very good. So if you want to bully Richard Herring to write that book, uh, please do follow him on Twitter and just keep badgering him to write the chapter about dinosaur penises. Um, <laughs> so there we go. And not cocks. <laughs> and not cocks, because cocks is a rude word. Uh, <laughs> it's weird, though. It's not, but it is. Anyway, I, I would ask you now not to send us your drawings of... <laughs> yeah, yeah, for once, let's... <laughs> for once, let's keep it clean, because uh, we'd like to be able to share these on Instagram and things like that, so and on Facebook. Obviously, do um, follow us all on all the social medias. You can hear a list of those at the end of the programme and in the show notes and on Patreon and everything else. So do do keep supporting the show. So um, do you have a... Yeah, I, I was going to say, do you have a favourite penis? That doesn't really make sense. <laughs> 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 do you have anything to add on that no no <laughs> <laughs> on the whole mating front yeah it's cool so i'm embarrassed now i'm going to go and make myself a cup of tea because i'm british uh and so and you see now i don't even want to roar because <laughs> so i don't want to say goodbye and go <laughs> So wrong. Okay, so um, until next time. Rawr. Rawr. <laughs> that was good. That was less sexy than last time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. If you want Terrible Lizards to keep bringing you more information about the world of dinosaurs, then we need to hear from you. Send us your dinosaur drawings and ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at Izzy underscore Lawrence and at Dave underscore Hone on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. We're hoping to to bring you more and more but we can only do that if we get enough listeners so please like share and subscribe <laughs>